Okay, all right, so here's where we were last time. Um, gosh, a lot of people aren't here, but uh, I understand it's a lovely Friday afternoon, and um, <laughs> I get it. Um, okay, so uh, we, uh, let's see here, the last time we were talking about um, uh, how to make geometric sense out of an ordered list of three vectors in R3, and it's a lot like two vectors in R2. It's got a lot of the same, well, it's got a lot of analogous properties, but it is geometrically pretty different. We talked through all this last time. There's the idea of a right-handed list. Keep in mind, we're not talking about the set of vectors. We are talking about the list where they are in a particular order. So with A first, B second, C third, this is a right-handed uh, arrangement. This is a left-handed arrangement, and this is neither, and all the different versions of neither, uh, as it turns out, are linearly dependent. And so I just uh, uh, call that third category dependent. Okay, so we talked last time about how right hand and left hand are mirror images of each other, right? Just like clockwise and counterclockwise are mirror images of each other. And let's see here, if you trade the positions of two of the vectors, for example, here I'm trading the positions of A and B, and trading the positions of two vectors changes the order. Uh, so uh, right hand turns into left hand. Uh, and then lastly, um, order is independent of rotations. And again, I think this one's pretty believable. If, for example, you look at my right hand here, if I say that you know that this represents uh, first vector, a second vector, third vector, and a right-handed list, if I rotate all the vectors, I can just rotate my hand right along with them. And that then is still a right-handed list. So independent of rotations. In other words, after you rotate, right-handed turns, well, it stays right-handed. Okay, all right. So, uh, so based on these three properties, I claim that right-handed, left-handed dependent is sort of a three-dimensional version of clockwise, counterclockwise, dependent uh, for R2. Okay. All right. Now, that said, there is a fourth property that kind of doesn't really quite exist in a distinct, meaningful way for two dimensions. Um, but uh, there's this idea of what I'm going to call cycling uh, vectors in the list. So if you have a list, A, then B, then C, cycling, for example... I'm going to take the C vector and put it where the B was, and then I'm going to take the B vector and put it where the A was, and then I'm going to take the A vector and put it where the C was. So everything kind of shifts over, and the one that falls off the end, well, you just put it back where the opening is on the other side. Um, so this cycling preserves order. So um, A, B, C, you can confirm for yourselves here, A, B, C is a right-handed list. Right. And then uh, what about BCA? Uh, okay, well, let's see here. Um, so B, right? C, A. Also a right handed list. Okay. All right. Okay, now there's some theorems I need to talk about, um, about determinant. You may have seen these in a linear algebra class. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I, I hope you have. These are really fundamental properties of determinant. Uh, some of these are, I consider these, this to be sort of the big geometric property of determinant. Um, and there's a lot to say here. It's a, kind of a mouthful to describe this theorem. So bear with me as I go through the setup. It's going to take quite a bit just to set it up. Um, we're going to start in two dimensions specifically with a list of two vectors in two dimensions. And with this list, we're going to make various other objects, which is free. Right? You can make whatever you want. We're going to make various objects in various ways, and the theorem is going to be about relationships between those things. But again, before I can talk about the relationships, I've got to build these things. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a matrix. I'm going to take the first vector and make it the first column, I'm going to take the second vector and make it the second column, and notice that means that this list has now effectively turned into a matrix. All right, so when you have an ordered list, you can make a matrix in this way. When you have a matrix, you can make a linear transformation in the usual way. <coughs> uh, excuse me. When you have a linear transformation, 
Uh, <clears throat> you can make a parallelogram by the following process. Uh, take the unit square, apply the linear transformation to the unit square, and what will come out is a parallelogram like this. The parallelogram is the image by way of that linear transformation of this unit square. This is a fairly standard, uh, fairly standard thing to want to do. And before I go on, a couple other things I want to note. Um, <clears throat> notice that you can uh, see what these edge vectors are by the following argument. Let's look at E1 here. There's E1. And I'm going to ask, what is the image of E1 itself? Well, E1, if I put it up there, I'm going to multiply A times the E1 vector. Uh, reminder, standard fact of linear algebra, when you multiply a matrix times a standard basis vector, you get a column. Right? Again, uh, 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 flashback <coughs> to 218. But of course, that column, by construction, is the first vector in the list, namely A. All right? So neat fact, uh, this parallelogram that you make in this way, A is one of the defining edge vectors. And then analogously, um, uh, similarly, and I'm going to leave this here. Um, the image of the E2 vector, namely what defines the second edge, defining edge of the parallelogram, is B. Okay, now again, I haven't really done anything yet. I've, I've created some things, but I haven't said any uh, statements about these things. So uh, here we go. Uh, first thing I want to say, uh, first substantial statement, there is a relationship between the matrix and the parallelogram. And it's a shockingly strong relationship. You take this matrix, you take the absolute value of its determinant, and it turns out that that is equal to the area of this parallelogram. So uh, I, again, I think this, I call this quite a shocker uh, because uh, if you think about the uh, the formula for determinant. The formula for determinant here is really, really, really simple formula. It's what I like to call three functional arithmetic, right? Um, add, subtract, multiply. Not even any division, right? Really simple arithmetic. Whereas, on the other hand, if you were to you know put yourself back into a high school geometry or high school trig class and ask yourself how would you compute the area of this parallelogram, well, you'd probably Oh, this is what they told me in high school geometry, is that you kind of drop a perpendicular, right? You multiply the, the, the base, which would be the magnitude of A, times the height, which is whatever that perpendicular is. And if you think about it, that base, the length of the A vector, involves the square root. Where's the square root in the determinant calculation? It's not there. Um, what about this, the, the perpendicular that you'd be dropping there? Well, the, uh, you're going to need to know the length of B. There's another square root. And you're going to need to multiply by the sine of that angle. Trig! Okay, so something that seems like it ought to involve multiple square roots and a trig function is computed by three function arithmetic. <laughs> seems highly implausible. But this is a true fact. Shockingly true fact. Okay, how are we doing? Does everybody see what I'm claiming here? All right. Okay. Um, don't forget the absolute values. That is an important part of this formula. Um, reminder that when you take the absolute value, you're basically throwing away any possible minus. You're throwing away what I'm going to call the sign. The plus or minus, you know, just, you know, just use plus. Okay, so here's the thing. What you throw away when you take the absolute value... namely the sign of the determinant, whether it is plus or minus, also tells you something interesting. It tells you whether this order of the list A, B is clockwise or counterclockwise. Yeah, question. Um, this is just a question about when you talk about the vector. Uh-huh. So, yep. I'm not really sure if like, the uh, vector is a vector that you can take the standard base because they're like one, yep. zero, and like zero, one. That's exactly right. Okay. Yep. Is that, is that cool? Yeah. All right, yeah, that's exactly what they are. Absolutely. Okay, so, yeah, so the sign of the determinant tells you whether your uh, list A, B, you know, A first, B second, uh, given what the vectors A and B are, is that a right, uh, excuse me, is that a clockwise or a counterclockwise list? And specifically, 
and I just want to fit all this on the screen at the same time. Positive means counterclockwise. That's what I've got a picture of right here. Counterclockwise. And you see counterclockwise uh, in the picture that I have, so that means that this determinant, uh, whatever that matrix is, in order to generate this picture, that determinant is positive. Um, now, I don't have a picture for the other two cases, so let me scroll out of the way so we're not you know, talking about that picture, but had it been the case that the determinant was negative, that would mean that the list was a clockwise list. So again, the vectors would have to have uh, kind of switched order. Um, and if the determinant were zero, that would mean that the pair of vectors was dependent, linearly dependent. Keep in mind, that's our sort of annoying third catch-all sort of uh, case of uh, something zero or one of them's parallel to the other one or something like that. Okay. All right. So the magnitude of the determinant tells you area. The sign of the determinant tells you the order. Everybody with me so far? All right. Now, um, last things I want to say, there's some other uh, text that I have uh, in there that I want to talk about a little bit. Uh, I'm going to come back up here to this picture, and uh, let's see here. Let me zoom a little bit more in. Here we go. Okay, so when you have a linear transformation like this, and we already talked about how the area shows up in the determinant formula. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so the magnitude of the determinant tells you what this area is. Sure. Here's a different way to say that. The magnitude of the determinant tells you what to multiply by the yellow area to get the orange area. Seems like an unnecessarily uh, clunky way to say it, but since the yellow area is 1, the thing you multiply by 1 to get orange area is orange area. <laughs> Right, so a little bit weird thing to say, but but what that's uh, what that's telling you, it's telling you something then about the linear transformation itself, right? It's not about just a list of vectors, um, but the linear transformation itself is it's stretching out areas, any areas in the plane, all areas are going to get stretched out by whatever that factor is, whatever this area is, that's the the what you might call the stretching factor uh, that t performs on any area in the domain. And uh, so that's uh, uh, useful information sometimes. Um, <clears throat> and, and again, it's a statement about the transformation as opposed to a statement about the image. Okay. Now, here's another thing that I want to talk about here. Um, another statement about the linear transformation. Let's talk about order again. Uh, you can see what I have here is a Clockwise, uh, excuse me, counterclockwise order. Right. Furthermore, we know that uh, green goes to green, blue goes to blue. In other words, the image of E1 is A, the image of E2 is B. So, yeah, sure, AB is counterclockwise, but let's not lose sight of the fact that uh, also E1, E2 also counterclockwise. Right? So let's think about what does this say about the linear transformation. Um, and keeping in mind, there's only so many things that a linear transformation can do. A linear transformation can stretch things. It can sort of magnify, which means stretch in both directions. Uh, it could rotate. It can do what's called a shear. Right? And let's see, what else can a linear transformation do? Well, there's one other thing a linear transformation can do. But before we get to that, all of the things I just described... Rotations, shears, uh, magnifications, and stretches preserve order. Like kind of like I have in my picture here. So I have a counterclockwise um, uh, uh, E1 and E2. If I magnify them or rotate them or shear them, whatever, it's still going to have a counterclockwise images. But there's again one other thing that a linear transformation can do. A linear transformation can flip. It can reflect over a line. You might say. Um, and just uh, to have a single word to describe it, I, I, the word I use is invert. So the linear transformation can, amongst all these other things it might be doing, it might flip things upside down. And now I'm going to draw an example of what that might look like. Uh, and so in particular, suppose that uh, 
A and B are literally different vectors, so I'm going to erase this. Uh, what if A, namely my first vector, was that one, and B, namely my second vector, was that one? Well, then let's see here. Then A would be this, B would be this, right? And let's think now, A to B, is that clockwise or counterclockwise? That is now clockwise, right? So saying that A and B, I should be careful, more careful than that, saying that the list A comma B is clockwise, Another way to say that is that the linear transformation T has turned a counterclockwise list into a clockwise list. In other words, that means that the linear transformation T is somehow or another flipping. You might say reflecting over some line. But amongst all the other, you know, uh, rotation, <coughs> shear, magnification, whatever, amongst all that other stuff, your linear transformation has to include a flip. Um, a.k.a. a reflection, a.k.a. an inversion. So uh, that's the alternative phrasing that I have here. And uh, you see here a negative determinant means that the linear transformation is inverting, a.k.a. there's a reflection involved uh, in the plane. Again, as you see in this picture, counterclockwise turns into clockwise. Yeah? Um, I'm just like a little confused about how like the matrix A with the A1, A2, B1, B2 mm -hmm. is related to um, the T and like the square and the parallelogram. Yeah, okay, so uh, the list makes the matrix. Now it, it's my matrix. I can make whatever I want, and that's. I'm just saying that's the that's the choice that I'm making. I'm using that list to make a matrix in this way, and once you have a matrix, that defines a linear transformation, right? That's our, our sort of a standard construction to turn a matrix into a linear transformation. And once you have a linear transformation, uh, then you can talk about uh, what would be the outcome. If I were to take the entire unit square, plug all those points one at a time into this linear transformation, what would come out? And what would come out, oh, whoopsie. Uh, what would come out is a parallelogram. Is that cool? Sure. Yeah. And uh, in particular, the the uh, the edges of that parallelogram would be the columns of the original matrix, which would be the vectors in the original list. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. So um, the sign of the determinant, positive, negative, or zero, is telling you about whether the linear transformation. Uh, doesn't invert the plane, or does invert the plane, or third possibility, and let's just think through this third possibility of what, what would happen if the uh, determinant zero, uh, the A and the B are dependent, if you come up here, and what, what would it look like if these vectors A and B were dependent? Well, they'd have to be, one's a multiple of the other, that means our picture really would look very, very different. It wouldn't look like this at all. I would just have uh, the image of E1 be like this. The image of E2, now again, it's dependent, so that means the image of E2 would have to be in the same direction. And that means that everything, this entire square, the image would be, well, it'd be all along this same line. And so areas in the plane you know, maybe they're rotating, maybe they're stretching, whatever, but at some point, there's a smush, right? And everything's being smushed. The two-dimensional areas are all being smushed into a one-dimensional line. Okay. And so that's why I wrote it down here as, uh, oh, I a squish, excuse me. Squish equals smush. Okay. Everybody on board? This is a shocking amount of ge natural geometric information that all comes out of this one thing, namely the determinant. Uh, tremendous amount of information. So th this is an awesome theorem um, and uh, uh, very important to, to have this under your belt before we proceed with multivariable calculus. Okay, now, um, uh, last thing I'll say, this is two-dimensional. Um, so next question. 
and I'm going to I'm going to uh, pose this as a rhetorical question first. But let's suppose I were to tell you this theorem about two dimensions. If you think about it, you know, two dimensions means two vectors means it's a two by two matrix, which gives me a linear transformation from R two to R two. Everything's two. What would you guess would happen if I said there's a three-dimensional version of this theorem? I'm going to suggest that the guess, and let's not worry about proving it. Let's just make a wild guess based on, I don't know, the pattern. Let's, hopefully the pattern holds. You'd probably imagine three vectors in R3. That would make a three-by-three three matrix, which would give you a linear transformation from R3 to R3, in which I wouldn't have a unit square exactly, but I'd have a unit cube which would make a parallel of piped instead of a parallel of gram. And determinant, well, let's see here. Parallel of pipids don't have air yet. They have volume. And the sign, uh, well, let's see here. Uh, all this business about clockwise, counterclockwise, would probably be right hand, left hand. Now, it's, this would all seem like the reasonable guess. And that's exactly what the three-dimensional version of the theorem is. It's really, really exactly what you would guess, right? So um, three vectors, three by three matrix, R3 to R3, uh, unit cube, parallelopiped, which has a volume, and order is determined by right hand, left hand dependent. So it's exactly analogous in all the ways that you would just totally expect. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> all righty. So with all that in mind, uh, we're going to move on now to talking about cross product, finally. Um, and I'm going to start with an apology. Um, when I make a definition, the, the ideal, you know, uh, uh, best case if you can is when you make a definition, it should be clear before you make the definition why you're making the choice that you are, right? So my favorite example is let's talk about um, uh, vector addition. And we have a formula for vector addition, uh, geometric picture that uh, if, you know, here's your first vector and here's your second vector, you do the whole head to tail thing and then you look at that as your sum vector. Now, what, what is it that geometrically natural about that? And let's think of it in terms of displacements. If you were to interpret that first vector as representing the action of moving, you know, this way by a certain distance, and then the second vector as the action of moving you know, that way by, well, whatever that distance is. Well, one displacement followed by a second displacement, the result would be the displacement moving from here to here. So vector addition in that sort of head-to-tail picture that we have is just a geometric model of the idea of uh, do a displacement and then uh, do the next displacement. It's physically natural. So vector addition is a composition of displacements, very, very natural. Um, and of course, that leads to the algebraic formula. The cross product, sadly, I'm just going to have to give you a formula to, to start off with. And, uh, you know, can I, can I, before I write this down, can I give you a, here's why it's geometrically natural? Sadly, no, I, I really can't. Um, so uh, I feel bad about that. <laughs> Again, uh, I like it when definitions just kind of seem like the natural choice to make. Um, but this is we're, what we're going to find is that if we, with a raised eyebrow, suspiciously accept this as a definition, then it's going to turn out that it, amazingly, surprisingly, there are some extremely strong connections to geometry, and this is an extremely useful construction. You're just going to have to take my word for it until we get there, um, and then you'll uh, you'll see those applications. Okay. All right. Now, for what it's worth, um, this formula here, the definition of the cross product, I have never memorized it in my entire life, and I never will. Uh, because there is a much easier version to, rem to remember, and this is what I encourage all of you to remember, is this thing called a uh, symbolic determinant. And let me, I'll talk about the symbolic in a minute. For the moment, let me sweep that under the rug. Uh, this formula right here, easy determinant formula. And look how easy this is to remember. You put your standard basis vectors along the top row, and then uh, whatever your first vector is, 
you put that along the second row, and then let's see what every, oh, color choices. Uh, whatever your second vector is, you put that along the third row. That's it. Standard basis vectors along the top, first vector, second vector. Nice and organized, nothing to accidentally get backwards, right? Much easier to remember compared to, again, the alternative. You look at your alternative, you can try to memorize this formula. I know if I were to try to memorize this formula at some point, I'd get this wrong. I'd have A3B2 minus A2B3. I just know I would, right? And I suspect I'm not alone in this. Um, so anyway, uh, I encourage you to think of this as being the formula for the cross product. Okay, now uh, let me go back and deal with the uh, the confession here. Uh, yeah, uh, this is kind of bogus. <laughs> Determinant is something you do to a matrix. A matrix has elements that are numbers. And this thing right here, E3, for example, that's just not a number. That's a vector. You're not really supposed to put vectors in the place where numbers are supposed to go. So eh, it's not really a matrix exactly. And so when I say I'm taking the determinant, okay, what I'm really doing is I'm saying let's ignore the fact that this is not really a matrix. Let's pretend that this is actually a matrix. Let's proceed in the computation of taking the determinant as if this really were a matrix. And uh, then whatever result we get, that's what I meant. That's what was intended by writing this. And uh, sounds a little fishy, sounds a little sloppy. It is. And the good news is nothing bad happens. It turns out this is actually fine. Uh, as a just a way of memorizing the formula, nothing, is, there's nothing bad happens. So um, don't worry about it, basically, that there's a little bit of kind of fishiness in this formula. It's not a problem. Now let me try to persuade you that these are actually the same. In fact, let's compute this determinant. Remember the formula for determinant, you go across the top edge. We start by taking this, we cross out the row and column, we multiply by this little determinant down here, and that gives me E1 times A2B3 minus A3B2. Uh, don't forget that E1 is a 1, 0, 0, and that actually gives us this part of the cross product. And then we go to the next element in the top row. We're going to have E2 times the determinant of this submatrix times a minus 1. Don't forget the whole plus minus plus thing. And that gives us this term. It's coordinate, I should say. And then uh, likewise for the third um, so uh, just, you know, straight up, just computing this in the usual way reproduces this formula. All right. Okay, next thing I want to point out. This is a um, surprisingly convenient answer to a seemingly odd question. But let's uh, entertain the question of what this is. I'm going to take the cross product, A cross B. Here's the formula for it. I'm going to take that cross product and I want to dot it with some other vector C. Uh, let's just write that down and see what we get. And I claim that what we get in this dot product of a cross product, I claim we get a straight up determinant. And not only is this a straight up determinant, it's a really easy determinant to remember. Uh, in particular, whatever this first vector is, that goes in the first row. Whatever the second vector is, second row. Whatever the third vector is, third row. Really natural, easy formula to remember. And again, that's just a matter of uh, uh, doing the arithmetic. You can just uh, check this directly. When you're taking this determinant, you get this times cross cross this determinant that gives you C1 times A2B3 minus A3B2, which is exactly this times that. That's the first term in the dot product. And then etc. on on you know along the top row, uh, aka down the, the dot product. So etc. So thus this works. Um, 
So um, this is a really powerful formula, as it turns out, uh, because what it does is it allows me to connect um, something that I understand with something, because we know a lot about determinants. We have a lot of geometric information about determinants. With something else that I understand, dot products, I understand dot products really well geometrically. Um, and connecting all of that with something that I want to understand. Right? We want to understand more about cross products. So this formula connects the thing that we're interested in with other things that we already understand. And that's a massive foot in the door. And uh, if you were to follow through with all of the proofs of the facts that I'm about to show you all, uh, this formula would figure very prominently uh, in, those, uh, in those arguments. Okay. All right, th that said, reminder, uh, you know, tough choices and all that, you know, this fast class, too much material, they don't have enough time. Among my tough choices I had to make, I, I, I've had to accept that as much as I enjoy showing y'all the proofs of the facts that I'm about to show you, I, we really don't have time for it. So the proofs, I'm going to be skipping a bunch of proofs as we go through the rest of this section. Um, so uh, you won't get to see so much of how this formula factors in, but it really does. Okay. All right, so here's the first one. First cool fact. The cross product of two vectors, always orthogonal to both of the input vectors. Another way to say that, if you have two vectors A and B, and if you want to find something that's orthogonal to both of your vectors A and B, cross product does it. Cross product is uh, orthogonal to both. Okay, um, if um, if you're curious, if you want to see, if you want to get a little bit of practice in uh, thinking about how these, how to use the various ideas and uh, that sort of thing, uh, feel free to read for yourself um, the the proofs here. I actually have two proofs in here of how to how to how to see this uh, result. You don't have to. You're not going to be tested on it, but it is good practice, and I encourage you to to take a little time and read it. Yeah. Can you just clarify? I know you said the other day which time, which uh, context you. Yes. So uh, the word perpendicular requires that both of the vectors you're talking about are non-zero. Yeah. Um, orthogonal just means the dot product is zero. Yeah. So, for example, uh, this statement here that uh, the cross product is orthogonal to A, that just means that their dot product is equal to zero. It just means, it literally just means that this equals zero. Uh, so orthogonal means dot product is zero. Is that cool? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. Okay. All right. So yeah, so so to that point, that's why I had to say this is orthogonal. It is not necessarily the case that the cross product is perpendicular because that would imply the cross product was non-zero and that's just not true. Plus, it would imply that the vector A and the vector B are both non-zero, and uh, that's also not necessarily true. It's perfectly fine to do a cross product with the zero vector. That's all good. So this is orthogonal, not perpendicular. Okay, good fact to know. Next surprising fact, um, this construction called the, oh, I, you know what, I, I skipped the terminology here, apologies. This expression here, because it's so important and how it connects to the determinant, uh, this is called a triple product. I think it makes sense to call it a triple product. After all, there are three vectors that participate in it. So, you know, anyway, reasonable term. Uh, that's the standard terminology, triple product. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this triple product here is equal to this triple product, which is equal to this triple product, which at a glance looks boring. Y'all have seen a bunch of kind of, you know, identities of dot products and cross products, and they, oh yeah, you can factor out scalars, and you can distribute, and yawn, right? But if you look a little bit more carefully, that is not what's going on here. For example, notice A in the first triple product it's not in any way a part of the cross product. And in this one over here, 
It is. It's one of the vectors involved in the cross product. So this is a very weird shuffling. This is not a uh, you know uh, just uh, you know a semi obvious kind of extension of boring old facts from high school algebra. This is a surprising and uh, very different fact here. So different ways you can see it. Uh, again, wish I had time. One way is to realize that triple products are determinants. Determinants, we already know a bunch of neat facts about what happens if you have a matrix and you switch two of the rows. Right? We know what happens there. And if you think about it, when you cycle, what you're really doing here is you're trading, you're doing two switches of position. And that's something to think about. That's uh, um, something to think about from, uh, again, from Math 218. Okay, but you can also think about each one of these uh, as being a determinant and then interpret determinants geometrically. And what you notice very quickly, and I'm, uh, I've got to be really quick here, um, these three determinants are all talking about the exact same parallelopiped, edges A, B, C. And so geometrically, if you interpret these triple products as determinants geometrically, and it's really not surprising because they're all talking about, again, the same geometric thing. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, God, this is a really cool proof right here. It really makes me sad that we can't talk about this. But, uh, again, we just don't have the time. Um, uh, real quick, let me start with the notation. This notation right here, uh, I, uh, I may have uh, – I either made this up or I don't remember where I'm copying it from. One or the other. Uh, the uh, the two parallel lines means parallel, and then the two vectors that follow. The understanding is that we're talking about the parallel uh, thing that you get from those two vectors, and so in particular, uh, these two vectors, you know, a, uh, and then uh, let's see here, uh, b. Um, uh, this uh, this parallel thing you get from those two vectors is this parallelogram. So y'all willing to buy that notation? It's just a, it's a very convenient shorthand uh, to represent this uh, this parallelogram. Okay. Okay. So to the theorem then, um, the magnitude of the cross product is equal to the area of that parallelogram. Really weird. Very weird, but true. And again, cool fact, and again, cool proof. Oh, whoops, I didn't mean to. Um, uh, there we go. Really cool proof. Give it a look if you have time. Uh, get us good practice, a little bit good mathematical weightlifting to make sure that you're, uh, uh, you know, th to give you practice in manipulating the ideas that we're talking about here. But uh, that magnitude equals that area is the punchline. Okay. Anybody question? Everybody good? Okay. Okay. Next cool fact. Um, the cross product is the zero vector, then your vectors are dependent. And now uh, I have to say dependent here because there's a possibility that uh, one of these two vectors might be the zero vector or these two vectors might be uh, uh, parallel. I would like to temporarily set aside just for the sake of uh, uh, a little bit of clarity is going to follow as a result. Let's temporarily set aside the possibility that one of these vectors might be zero. So let's assume that we've got non-zero vectors. What this says in that case for non-zero vectors is if the cross product is zero, the vectors are parallel. And if you think about it, let's remember an old fact about dot products. If the dot product is zero, that means that the vectors are perpendicular. So cross product and dot product Equaling zero either tells you the vectors are parallel or perpendicular. So highly analogous in that way. Right? I think that's a neat fact. Okay. But of course there's a possibility A could be zero, in which case you can't you know, okay, anyway. All right. Okay. All right, next cool fact. This list where you have two vectors followed by their cross product. This list, I'm going to say this deliberately sloppy uh, first time through. This list is in right-hand order. 
Okay, yeah, but there's this annoying possibility one of the vectors might be zero, or maybe uh, maybe the cross product might be zero. Uh, so when uh, if zero's involved, you can't say right hand order because well, it's not. It's the you know the it's it's just not right. So zeros are always annoying when you're talking about right hand and left hand order. So to fix this fact, what I can say, and this is not sloppy, this list is never in left hand order. And so another way to say that is that list is in right hand order unless one of these three vectors is the zero vector. In which case, uh, gripe, um, uh, you know, uh, dependent, of course. All right. Okay, so again, nice proof. Again, you're not responsible for it. Um, I, I do want to give you uh, one other cool fact about this, though, and this is uh, just for your, you know, again, if you're looking for uh, a practice problem, if you're looking to cut your teeth on, on something, uh, this is going to use both stuff that we're talking about here in this section and also some old facts from Math 218. But if you look at this trio of vectors, A, B, cross product, you think about what the span of this list of three vectors is. And then you'd ask, what's the dimension of that span? Okay, well, we've got three vectors. So the span is <coughs> three or fewer dimensions, right? The weird thing is, true that that is, yes, the dimension is three or fewer. Weirdly, it can't be two. It could be three, it could be one, it could be zero can't be two. So that's a nice little exercise to ask yourself why that ought to be. Uh, give that uh, some thought if you'd like. Um, and if you're curious, again, uh, if you get stuck, um, come talk to me about it. I'll be happy to clarify. But I just think that's a weird fact um, and good practice. Okay, okay moving along. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, the cross product reminder, we, we defined the cross product with a weird formula. We've seen, nevertheless, even though it was defined algebraically, we've seen a bunch of very natural geometric facts about the cross product. Right? It connects to a lot of natural geometry. And uh, here's another sort of, uh, this is, a, I wouldn't call this a summary exactly, but um, here's a way to take some of those facts and do something interesting with it. Uh, this collection of three statements, not only are these three statements all true about the cross product, but these uh, serve as a way to uniquely characterize the cross product. Said differently, you can use this as the definition of the cross product. This is an alternative way to define cross product. And I don't do it this way for two reasons. First of all, I, even though this is all geometric, you know, perpendicular area, left hand order. I mean, this is these are all geometric ideas. Even though they're geometric, it's still not very uh, intuitive why we would care about this odd combination of geometric facts. Kind of, why would I want a vector whose magnitude is the area of the parallel? It just seems strange, you know. Um, uh, the other reason I don't like to start with this uh, as a definition of cross product is that taking these uh, geometric statements and then working back to to derive the formula, that weird formula from, that we use as a definition, is very tedious. And if you don't believe me, look in the book. Uh, the book uses this as the definition, uh, and uh, you can see how the book calculations proceed. I think you'll find... This is pretty cryptic and opaque and, and uh, unattractive. Um, so uh, take a look for yourself. But uh, it remains anyway, though. It's kind of neat to know that if you're talking about a cross product, there's this nice geometric way to characterize it. It's the unique vector that is orthogonal to the inputs. The magnitude is equal to the area of the parallelogram. And it's in right-hand order, you know, asterisk. Well, it's never left-hand order. So cool fact. All right. Next cool fact. The cross product is not commutative. That's very disappointing. Right? Dot product's commutative. A dot B equals B dot A. Scalar multiplication is commutative. Right? Um, X times Y equals Y times X. I mean, yeah, high school algebra, we move factors around inside of a term all over the place, willy-nilly. Right? can't do that with cross product. Every time you do, at least, you have to, don't forget, to 
put in a factor of minus 1. Okay. All right. So be careful with that. It's really easy to get that backwards. Um, okay, a couple more facts. Um, we already saw this next one, but since we're talking about cross product, I thought I should throw it in here. Uh, this is, again, something you can prove using uh, old Math 218 facts, you know, properties of the cross product. But cross product with a fixed vector A, I can think of that as defining a linear transformation. We talked about this last week. And that being a linear transformation, uh, is um, excuse me that thought of as a function <coughs> is a linear tra linear transformation. So specifically, uh, there's what t does. There's what t does. There's what t does. And notice that what this statement says is that if I have a linear combination on the inside, aka before I apply the linear transformation, then it's the same as if I apply the linear transformation on the outside, namely after I apply the linear transformation. You get the same thing either way. So that's what linearity is. And it doesn't matter uh, if you uh, uh, have the, uh, the, the linear, excuse me, if you have the, the uh, fixed vector cross product on the left or on the right. Either way, linear. So, nice facts. Um, good, good stuff to know. I don't know why this isn't in the book. It's really cool facts and it really ought to be. Okay. Um, here's another neat fact. Uh, not only is the cross product not commutative, it's also not associative. Uh, and this one, this one's even worse. The failure to be commutative factors down to a simple minus sign. The failure to be associative, uh, there's no fix. These are just unrelated expressions. They're just different. They're not the same. They're not negatives of each other. There's no particular relationship. They're just different. But again, very dangerous. We've all kind of got accustomed by high school algebra to feel like we can kind of move parentheses around uh, uh, collecting together factors in whatever order we want. You cannot do that with cross products. Uh, and you get burned uh, if, you, uh, if you do. Okay. All righty. Okay, a couple of quick applications, and I think we'll then have to call it. Um, so um, y'all may or may not have seen this thing called torque previously. Um, just a real quick uh, micro um, uh, physics lesson. Uh, torque is kind of, in a way, a sort of analogous to force. So force is a way of saying how hard are you pushing on something, right? Torque says how hard are you twisting, how hard are you turning, Something. And so um, it's uh, it's related to force, but it's just not the same thing. So, for example, a, um, a uh, 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 you know one day I don't know if any of y'all have ever tried to change a tire on your car. Um, well, it's really hard to do because they they use an air wrench uh, to put those bolts on there as, as well they should because you want those bolts on really tight. You don't want your your car tire uh, flying off <laughs> right while you ride down the road. So they're on there really, really tight. Well, if you have a crowbar, you know, pushing as hard as you can, and it's just uh, it's really hard, you may or may not be able to get it off at all, right? So what they have for just such an occasion is something called a cheat bar or a cheater bar. And what it is is an iron pipe that's as long as you want it to be. Uh, the one I used to drive around with back when I was concerned about this sort of thing was about four feet long. Right? And you just put that iron pipe right over your uh, crowbar, and then instead of pushing with the, all your weight on something that's this far away from the bolt, now you're pushing with like four times the length. Now I'm still pushing down with the exact same amount of force, right? still pushing as hard as I can, but because of that, uh, that long uh, radius arm, four times as much radius arm, I'm pushing with, as it turns out, four times as much torque. So torque, as it turns out, you, you know, quantify all this, torque is a cross product. It's the force that you're pushing with, but then cross with that radius arm vector um, that, among other things, encapsulates how, how long is your, uh, is your cheater bar. Okay. So anyway, um, neat fact. Um, Again, the punchline here is that cross product 
is relevant to a, a natural, simple uh, physics uh, quantity. Okay, and then the last one, magnetic fields. This is a weird fact of physics. This is just empirical. Um, just to, this is, is the way it is. If you have a uh, charged particle that's moving with a certain velocity, and if it's moving through a magnetic field, which is represented by a vector, B, um, it turns out, and again, physics is weird. Uh, this just is what it is. There's no, don't, don't ask why this is. Nobody knows why the universe is the way it is. We only know that it is the way it is. Um, charged particle moving through a magnetic field makes a force. And the formula for that force involves a cross product again. Right, so this force that the particle experiences is uh, like that uh, as computed by a cross product. Okay. All right. Now the very last thing that I'm going to say, and then we'll call it a, call it a week, um, <clears throat> is uh, about one other uh, collection of applications of cross product. Um, it uh, it turns out that very often in math, um, applications for something you define end up showing up way down the road. It's usually not... Anyway, it's, it's often, I think fair to say usually not the case, that uh, when you define some construction, you may have to do a lot of work to get to where it's actually going to be useful for something. So that's going to happen in this class. We're going to have to wait until we get to Chapter 7. And as it turns out, in Chapter 7, we're going to see more very powerful applications of the cross product. It's a big deal in uh, uh, computation of uh, something called flux and some related theorems. Uh, so, and again, we will see that in Chapter 7, another big application of the cross product. Okay, and uh, we're going to draw the line right here. And you all have a great weekend. Uh, see you later. Don't forget the homework is due tonight. Um, uh, 11 p.m. upload on Gradescope. Uh, just to make sure, uh, go ahead and give yourself a little time. Don't wait until uh, 10 to 59, right? And uh, make sure you get it in on time. All right, see you later. Have a good weekend.